Royal support for Buddhism and Jainism continued for about a thousand years, and this partly accounts for the absence of distinctly Hindu religious monuments before the 9th century CE. The little evidence of Hindu religious buildings has survived, Libraries show that Hinduism was indeed responding to the challenges posed by Buddhists and Jains, though in an intellectual rather than a physical way. Hinduism's response took one of two forms. First, Hindus restructured their philosophical and theological systems. They elaborated upon or argued against ideas developed by Buddhists and Jains. For example, Hindus accepted the belief of rebirth and redeath. They took up other concepts, such as karma, which adds up the negative and positive influences generated by good and bad deeds. Hindus also embrace the idea that karma can have an impact that carries on through several incarnations. But they rejected the notion that the Buddha had learned the way to salvation. A second type of Hindu response emphasized the worship of personal divinities. The gods who became the focus of this devotion were not the same as those found in the Vedic texts. Vishnu, Shiva, Krishna and Rama now came to prominence, while Indra and the rest declined. The Upanishads had contained some early indications of the Hindu philosophical response to Buddhism and Jainism. For example, the Taittiriya Upanishad begins with several statements that almost directly quote from Buddhist treatises. Yet as it proceeds, the Taittiriya Upanishad concludes that there is a real self, something which the Buddhists deny. Hindu philosophers and theologians began to systemize ideas that had not been fully worked out in the Upanishads. In the late 8th and early 9th century CE, a talented philosopher named Shankara would become the most celebrated exponent of the position which eventually became known as Advaita Vedanta. Advaita literally means not to. Advaita Vedanta therefore claims that the ultimate Brahman and the individual self or Atman are one and the same. Shankara said that the gods are lower forms of the one Brahman. He said people do not harm themselves by worshipping a personal god. Shankara himself was a devotee of the god Shiva. But Shankara believed that eventually each person must go beyond dependence on individual deities. He said that each of us will realize that all distinct gods are imperfect reflections of what he called the Brahman without qualities. Shankaracharya's Advaita Vedanta, sure enough, is a very strong position in India. The question is, is why is it such a strong position? German romanticists in the 19th century, uh, and most notably Schopenhauer, took an, a great interest in Advaita Vedanta. Why? Because it was non-dual. And this was most dissimilar to the traditions that these German romanticists saw pervading Europe in this time period. So rather than looking at things that were like their own traditions and say other dualist positions, they really looked towards non-dualism. Although this position is certainly interesting and certainly is one that many Hindus today follow and certainly one that most people equate with Hinduism, not all Hindus believe this position, and there are dual positions, dualist positions, Dvaita positions, where the Atman and the Brahman are regarded as separate, as distinct, as two. The early centuries of the Common Era saw an enormous burst of creative energy in India. There were plays, poetry, stories and many other forms of literature that expressed this new creativity within Hindu civilization. Two works came to have both literary and religious significance. One was an epic poem called the Mahabharata, a rough translation of the title Mahabharata might be the great book of the Bharatas. Bharat was the ancestor of two royal families. 
the Kuravas and the Pandavas. Five Pandava princes have gambled away their right to rule in a dice game. The Kuravas won the kingdom, which was to be returned to the Pandavas after a span of 13 years. But in the 13th year, the Kuravas did not fulfill their promise. The result was the great Bharata War. Some 18 chapters of the Mahabharata have become sacred scripture in their own right. These 18 chapters are known collectively as the Bhagavad Gita, which means the Song of God. The Gita is a dialogue between a Pandava prince, Arjuna, and his chariot driver, who is the Hindu god Krishna in human form. Krishna instructs Arjuna about the nature of reality. At one point, Arjuna looks across the battlefield towards the Kurava army. In the opposing ranks, he sees his cousins, an old teacher, and other friends. He's filled with dread and remorse at the thought of having to kill them. Throughout the Gita, Krishna listens patiently as Arjuna frets about the potential consequences of such murderous actions. Krishna refutes each of Arjuna's objections and he reveals that he is truly God. The warrior Arjuna soon learns that Krishna decrees the course of every event and Krishna tells Arjuna that his divinely established duty is to fight. We must not forget that Arjuna is a warrior. He's born as a warrior. And Krishna is merely suggesting to him that he should follow his swadharma, his nature, his self-nature, which is as a kshatriya, as a warrior, to fight, regardless of his relationship with his opponents. So, in for that matter, for Arjuna to do otherwise, for example, to follow the swadharma, the nature of a brahmin, another caste, a priest caste, he would be doing the worst thing possible. Arjuna is a warrior, a warrior's swadharma duty is to fight. Arjuna must fight. Krishna declares that no evil karma will arise as long as Arjuna focuses on the task itself and performs it without a desire for self-gain. As Krishna says to Arjuna, These bodies come to an end, but the scriptures declare the eternity of the soul, which is indestructible and unfathomable. Therefore fight, O son of Bhagavad. Those who believe themselves killers and those who think that they are really slain do not truly understand. They are neither killers nor are they killed. Hindu civilization has a very long history. Its more literate and educated members have a tendency to preserve older cultural forms. They accept newer ones as nothing more than extensions of the previous system. New forms and new ideas simply add more layers of culture, coexisting with the older beliefs and customs. Some observers have mistaken this persistence of older forms for changelessness and stagnation, but it also provides a sense of permanence, while at the same time accommodating massive change. The Hindu religion doesn't have any specific founder. Like there's many beliefs that are inherent in the tradition. Some people take a devotional belief towards the Supreme. Some follow the path of jnana, which is um, a path of knowledge or recognition. There's many different approaches. There's karma yoga, which is the path of selfless service. All these things. So almost any tradition or any belief that's followed, it has some parallel in the Hindu tradition. The symbol may be slightly different, but what it represents is paralleled in the Hindu tradition. Mm -hmm. In India, you might be in a house where there's three or four people, and each one could be approaching the Supreme in a different way. In fact, 